Take this away, mate. Uh, this is this is it, kind of the the late mid season break that extended into an international break. <laughs> 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 and now we're back. Morg. Play the fucking intro. Okay. Hello ladies and gents and welcome back to the Football Booth Podcast, episode 17. It's been a long time coming, but it's finally here. My name is Fennan, John alongside me, my right hand man, does it no one better than anyone else. I've got my boy, Mayhem, how have you been? Good mate, good. Um, I've said in the sort of the, the warm up here, it, it seemed like it may never happen. It went on, it went on that long. It did, it um, went on for, well yeah, it went on longer than it should have. We really did extend that winter break. Episode 16. In between that, we've had you frequent the the island of Ireland. It's controversial. Um, and, and go back. We've had ups and downs. We've had a Manchester derby. Um, we've had Gary Neville dropping billionaire bottle job bombshells that seems to have triggered every Chelsea fan and it's beautifully glorious I love to see him triggered <laughs> um, and, and now we're, now we're, we're back <laughs> ah, they can just sing about some celery and be happy again can't they yeah they could they love that song <laughs> well, I, mean, I, mean, I mean the last time we recorded we hadn't even covered deadline day we're not going to cover deadline day we're going to keep with the times yeah Yeah. that was an absolute waste of time anyway for the pair of us i mean more with card if it was kind of like london buses like you wait fucking days for one and then two show up at the same time so but i feel we'll break each each layer bit by bit as we go on this evening and um but yeah it's been a month since we've been away um, obviously a lot has gone on behind the scenes uh, there was a little vacation in it for myself I was over in your neck of the woods which was like I said before we went live I don't think the holiday blues have quite worn off just yet but a very enjoyable four days over in Antrim with you and the family good to see everyone again good to actually <laughs> see the kids of age now as well <laughs> and I uh... Smart, doesn't it? Um, and it, it, it's strange for them because, especially, especially like Kiernan, and he, he would have like, we had a bit had a jumped in your streams from from time to time, and, and he'd have watched, and he'd have asked, "Who who's that?" And um, difficult to, to to quantify it because you know the when I say I ask Daddy's friend, they quantify that to you know being Uncle Sam and and this and the other. So good to. Good to get over. Um, I'm sure you've you're, you're well rested and fully set now on only having one. Good, good job, good plan. Because um, oh, the, oh, well, the, the, there was more to that discussion that me and my darling partner Maria had when I got back, and um, we'll 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 cover over that when we're done recording. Um, <laughs> um, let's just say there was a bit of negotiating and compromise in there, so to speak. Um, All those football manager skills put to good use, and then yeah, putting the arm around and saying, you know, it's, this may not have been the best idea. Um, but no, it was it was good. Um, we dipped our toe, obviously, in in the the world of the Six Nations as well. Um, you know, we're, we're versatile, well-rounded sports fans. You know, we really are. Yeah, we we kind of basically avoided football as much as possible, which was understandable at the time because. It hadn't been, well, I mean, we're talking two weeks ago now, and Cardiff were going through a rough patch. Celtic still kind of are, and we'll get on to that very shortly. But And so we explored our other interests sports-wise. We enjoyed a bit of pool, a bit of darts, and then, well, you, you enjoyed the Six Nations. I just got my, my toe burnt, essentially. Yeah. Um. Van der Merg, absolute hero. Um, but yeah, yeah weird, was, weird accent he's got though. But yeah, it's, it's a strong Edinburgh accent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but 
but yeah, it, it was it was good. It's good to be back though. Really. Good to be good to be venting and and dissecting um, the the games. I don't know quite how far back we'll go because it could be could be a very long podcast. So yeah, no, I don't think we'll dive back too much. I think we'll I think we'll do like a like a brief summary as to how what has what has taken place over the last month. So, like I said, uh, in recent times, you know, times have been better with Cardiff, and we'll get onto them later on in the episode. But uh, in the world of you and Celtic, Joel, uh, I mean, I've got to word this very carefully. I don't want to press any of the wrong buttons with you. I never like to do that. But there's been a change at the top at the summit of the Central Premiership in that time. Uh, This past Saturday. Rangers actually dropped points at home to Motherwell and it looked very promising very prospective that yesterday uh, not yesterday, it was Sunday uh, Sunday that uh, Celtic had a massive opportunity to regain top spot and after a first half red card and Adam Ida penalty miss, it just all went wrong it all fell apart um i did i only i only caught a few snippets of the game but knowing you joel when i was last over you had you had the motherwell game up which you did eventually win in the end which was good to see and it was probably i felt like a felt like a bad omen when i was sitting there on the couch with you watching it probably and so but what did go wrong for celtic <laughs> I'm wary, I'm wary of of saying things because it's going to play into the narrative of this disgruntled, you know, cliche. You know, it wasn't us; it was something else. Um, and I think I've been consistent throughout the English Premier League and, and throughout the Scottish um, Premiership of holding officials to as much account as I possibly can as a podcaster um, with obviously you know without the, a massive audience that's going to you know be clipped up and, and sent out there and you know affect too many narratives um, I've, I've tried I try to be as um, when I'm reviewing the games as, as drawn back and you know seeing the full picture as uh, uh, as possible Celtic putting it out there were not Great, and you know, I think you can say that for pretty much the last six months, we haven't been great. Um, wedged in between an okay second half performance at Motherwell that got us over the line, there was the anomaly of the 7 0 against Dundee, where Dundee were really toothless, but it did show us that Owen Beck missing out on him wasn't too bad because he ain't the I guy. I can't believe he went back to Dundee, Christ, because because Yang t- tore him apart and. We've we've spoken in length about Yang, um, but what I, I can't get my head around is how the state of the the officiating throughout Scotland, and you know, it reared its head to where it, in post match press conferences, Stephen Naismith and and Lauren Shanklin. Both are not Celtic men by any degree of the imagination. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not well informed on that, you know, draw from your own conclusions uh, of where their lawyers would lie. Um, saying that they thought that they were fortunate to get the penalty um, and, and maybe Yang was unlucky to to, to see red. Or in, within that vein, you know, I'm sure someone could take it out of context and say I'm, I'm talking shit, but it was, it was in that vein. So... For me, what, what I want to be super clear about here is this this isn't just subject to our game. Anyone that watched the Rangers Motherwell game and thinks that the tackle on Ross McCosland that then means that he has to go off is not a red card for the Motherwell player. It's ludicrous. The, the boy is out of control, injures the player... We obviously it must get checked by VAR. Doesn't get given. It is a stonewall red card. Motherwell should have been sent off. 
uh, the Marvel player should have been sent off. So that's the first one this weekend. And look, I, I'm sure that there's Aberdeen fans and there's St Johnston fans and they're, they're all, all around the country that, that could say, well, why are you not talking about our game? I didn't watch your game. I didn't watch sports scene this week, this weekend, for obvious reasons. Um, so I, I haven't seen. But we we know there's glaring things like the the Alan Forest um, one at Tyne Castle where he goes round the keeper, brought down, doesn't get given. The St Mirren player that gets sent off when he's pulling his legs away. Um, the Sterling one again for Rangers where he slips into the tackle, and the. The VAR gives the chance, gives the referee the chance there to go over and reverse his decision, and he decides to stay with the on-field decision. So this isn't just VARs not fit for purpose; it's, it's the refs are not fit for purpose, and they seem to counteract each other. So on the weekend, when Yang tries to flick the ball over his head, and the the referee books him, if that's just it, I don't think at any point does anyone complain that he doesn't get sent off. We see it literally the same incident last week away at Motherwell where Liam Scales is going to head the ball and Blair's got his foot up at his head and he doesn't get sent off. We've seen it before with mm. with O where he, he has his foot up. We've seen it, you know, multiple occasions. So that's the first thing. How is the red card? I, I, I don't know. There's no excessive force, right? There is no excessive force. He's trying to flick the ball over his head and, and whether he makes contact with the boy's face is debatable as well but you know Cochrane does well for his team I guess and you know he, he gets some advantage bear in mind before that Celtic had a penalty which was never a penalty in a million years again Yang kind of gets slightly in front of Cochrane throws himself to the ground Yang should be booked for diving it is never a penalty and a penalty is given and VAR again looks at it and decides that it it's not clear and obvious because there's that, that grey area. So what I would love to know is when he's booked the player for putting the foot up, how that is a clear and obvious mistake that it needs to be upgraded to a red. Then you look at the penalty for a while. What, what can he do to get himself out of the way to, to not hit his arm? And by that point, you know, we're one down, we're down to 10 men. And we're, you know, we're, we're fighting a very difficult battle. You know, Adam Eder's missed a penalty beforehand, but like I've just said, it was never a penalty. Um, Celtic didn't play particularly well. We, yes, we were down to 10 men, but didn't play particularly well. Kyogo, come on. I don't know what Brandon's done to Kyogo. He's broke the B-man. But, yeah, we, we look in, in, in dire straits. Callum McGregor's out and um, went off in midweek against Dundee. He was injured for Hearts. How long he's going to be out, but I don't know. But... There's some there's some real obvious areas of this squad that we need people to step up. Um, I think Adam Eder has been. I don't want to. You know, I think, he's, I, I think he's been quite a silver lining for you boys. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's come in and he's come in and done well. He applies himself. He gets about. He triggers the press, um, and yeah, he holds the ball up and he has good interplay. So I think he's he's been a decent um, addition um, for for the back end of the season, um, but. Just absolutely confused as to, to what it is we're trying to implement. You know, the style still seems the same as it was all those years ago when Rodgers was leaving. Everyone in Scottish football seems to have cottoned on to it. We we struggle to break down a low block. The counter attack seems to be really decisive against us. And yeah, we're we're in a we're in a real tough moment. You know, this is where champions stand up and be counted. Um I imagine there'll be more twists and turns, you know, with two games against them left. So there will be twists and turns either way, I mean, whether the, the gap extends or, or, you know, we overtake them. So you know, there's there's big games still to come, but at the moment we need, we need to find something because we are, we just lost. Matt O'Reilly, he's gone well off the ball since the Atletico Madrid. Mm-hmm. The Rio Atati, I don't know what injury it is, but he, I mean, he must have had a leg amputated because he seems to have been away for forever now. So, Callum again, how long's that going to be? Taylor just looks derived of any confidence in the amount of times he gives the ball away. The Liam Scales experiment that he's had, a, he's had a good season, but I think it's well and truly done. Um, and I would like to see like Norovsky be in there or, you know, rotation with Scales and Lager Bielka, or just give the boy a break, because what you're going to end up doing is tainting his whole season. Mm-hmm. 
because it's game after game and it's pressure after pressure and you're going to end up tainting the guy's season. I think he's had a really good season. And I think it's difficult to remember that, you know, if we don't go on to have success in the season, it will just be veered as a, it will be seen as a, as a complete disappointment. Um, and no one, re- no one remembers you when you have a good season, but you only don't win anything. So I would like to see him get a little bit more rotation and, you know, blood in, if it's going to be Narofsky, he's going to be the guy, then blood him in. I think Lagerbielka is done at the club from obviously, you know, the saga that unfolded towards the end of January and he didn't end up leaving. Um, and, yeah, up, up front, it's just shocking. Yeah. No, a, t- a tough r- a tough time all round for Celtic at the moment. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm the, I remember you expressing a month ago when we last recorded um, and that you, you, you didn't feel comfortable and you, you had that sense of anxiety of Rangers catching you and thought that this season would be the best opportunity for Rangers to to do that. But if, then, you if know, they don't win the league this year, yeah, they do not win the league. Shite, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's it from. And by, by no means are they a, an amazing football team. They, they can have, you know, Philip Clement um, that's drunk the Kool Aid across there, and he's got his brown brogues and his tie on, and he's drunk from the fucking loving cup or whatever bollocks they do, and he's maybe had a wee ride on their bicycle in their in their trophy cabinet, and he's well and truly took the Kool Aid on, and he may think they're a good football team. But they're not. They're not. They're still relying on a right back to get them through games. No, exactly. Yeah. So, so you know, they're, they're not a good football team. This is this is honestly too. Selwick are a poor team, and Rangers are a poor team, and it will it will just be who gets it together at the back end of the season. Um, they have a real team spirit, a real togetherness, which is going to help them massively. Um, although the the boos were deafening um, at Ibrox on, on Saturday night. Um, so we'll, we'll see how they react. They're, they're obviously still in Europe and played Benfica. So it's an, another couple of games added on to their schedule, a couple of really, really tough games. And they'll be coming off, off the back of that, which may have a, a part to play. Um, but it will be who who gets it together. Um, but I, even if we go on and win the double, you know, we win the Scottish Cup and we win the league, which at the moment does seem unlikely, fair play. Even if we were to go and do that, I don't think Brendan Rodgers will stay in the summer. I think he's been lied to. But no matter what your opinion is of Brendan, and mine isn't very high from, from his antics before, I think he's been lied to by Peter Laurel. Um, you know, come back and tout and things like, oh, well, we'll see all the fans here in May and I'm coming here to compete in the Champions League. And we're signing fucking Lewis Palmer. Yeah, I mean, well, this is the thing. There's nothing really to take from the the January transfer window as well, where it was a big opportunity to really reinforce certain areas in the squad, and nothing was addressed. And now you're missing key players, and you're two weeks out from the league split, and that's when it's the crucial time where, like you said, you you need that championship mentality, and you need those players to, you know, stand up for themselves and make the games count yeah it's gonna it's gonna be tough um i mean we've managed to do it again we've gone to spend three million on nicholas coon um and all he seems to be able to do is chop back on the wing and pass back yeah no but, it, it feels uh, like he's he's one that's definitely been written off quite early on as well which goes a long well, yeah it goes a long way in itself just you know it can't can't get in can't get into the team over yang and we've said this before, all right, Yang looked decent against Dundee. Um, he's going to be suspended. So I imagine he come. you know, I imagine that boy comes back into the team now. <laughs> and you've given absolutely no encouragement to believe that they'll be effective and they'll make anything happen. Because um, he hasn't done before. So, you know, do we revert to... A slightly different system. I wouldn't mind seeing Kyogo. I know it isn't his natural position, but I wouldn't mind seeing him play kind of like a, an inside forward role, maybe coming off the left, play Maeda on on the right because we've got no better options. I'm not saying Maeda's a good player; he's not. He's a good athlete. Very good athlete. <laughs> yeah, good right um, turn for him. Athlete. A football player was struggling, um, but there's just not enough. The, the drop-off's too big. You know what I mean, we've got Bernabe again that we spent the money on. 
Um, that was obviously when Andrew was here, but you know, Brendan wants to play Tony Ralston as a left back over him. Um, we we'll look at Alistair Johnson. He had a purple patch when he came to the club, but we've lost Juranovic and bringing Johnston looks to be a downgrade. You know, we've lost Carl Starfelt, um, which loads of people wanted to berate. Um, and I think it's one of those things that you don't really understand what you've got until they've left. Because again, you know, Liam Scow's coming and he's been he's been good, but certainly hasn't you know, been that formidable partnership the same way that Starfelt was with Carter Vickers. Um McGregor hasn't had his best season. You know, normally McGregor's that reliable seven out of eight every game. He hasn't hasn't had the same season. Matt O'Reilly started well, he's gone off the boil. Um and we've been flicking between you know, that other centre midfield player, whether it be David Turnbull, who's obviously away now, he's, he's down with one yourselves. Of us, one of us, um, one of us. Hattati that can't seem to get fit. Bernardo that had that purple patch, scored in the derby, scored a couple of goals um, around the, you know, the, the start of the year. But again, has, has dipped a little bit and has suffered from Adam Eder coming in and Brendan experimenting with a few different systems that were including both Kyogo and Anida and Bernardo was the unfortunate person to drop out of the team. So just just everywhere. And Joe Hart's announced his retirement, so we, we now have to go out and get a new keeper. But you know you have, you have no confidence in this recruitment team to go and deliver that. And this is the thing, so, I mean, we're we're still a good few months out from the summer transfer window. And even now you're not feeling confident. Yeah, you don't you don't deliver you don't expect or feel that you can rely on, on the recruitment team to go and deliver, you know, a keeper that, that's gonna come in and even be of the same quality of Joe Hart. And Joe Hart has his weaknesses. I mean the, the, the guy couldn't catch a cold. I don't know why he's insistent on punching everything. <laughs> and and again I think Joe Hart is okay. I'm I'm not desperate to replace the guy. But could we improve? Yes. Could we do worse? Yes, we've got Scott Bain on the bench. So, you know, we, we could definitely do worse. And Barkas was in nets for us a couple of seasons ago. Yes, we could do worse. But, so, but there's glaring weaknesses. You know, he isn't comfortable from set pieces and crosses and stuff like that. He will not catch the ball. But can we go out and, and get someone in of equal of, of equal standard at least? Probably not. Well, I think I think and, the biggest question at the moment, like I mean, not even players, but like if Brendan does go in the summer, who is next in line? Yeah, it's petrifying, isn't it? And this is the probably, thing, I think probably be on the fucking phone to Lenny. No, knowing, knowing Derek Desmond, they probably give him Roy Keane. He's been watching fucking stick to football podcast too much. I think so. I give Roy a call. Yeah. I'll come in and show you about oh, passion. God. I, I, remember, I remember his name coming up before Brendan came came in. It's, it's the time. If if you're if you're Irish or Northern Irish, you you have a chance of getting the Celtic job if, if it was Derek Desmond just solely left to choose. Martin O'Neill will be fucking tatted for fuck's sake. Like it's it's pathetic. The, the names that get batted around. Steve Clark is always in the mix. Why is Steve Clark going to leave his job? But no matter what you think of Steve Clark, and again, we've spoken a length about my opinion of Steve Clark <laughs> and his ability, his ability to make watching paint dry a more attractive proposition than watching the style of football that he plays. But it's working well, with Scotland, fair to say. Yeah. It is working. But, but why would he leave Scotland when we're, when we're in a major competition? Why would he have any attraction to leave that job? Now? He wouldn't. He's not going to come. No, it, it wouldn't happen. It really so wouldn't happen. So it's, so it's not going to be him. And you know, I wouldn't want him either. I don't. I don't fancy playing five at the back and trying to convince Kieran Tierney to come come back and play fucking left centre back. Um, so no, thank you. But who else is out there? Because you know, if we fuck this season up, which it looks like we've got every chance of doing, we then have to qualify. We don't go straight into the groups. So you've got to then bring a manager in. There's certain players that are just going to leave. Matt O'Reilly is going to leave in the summer. Rio Tati is going to leave in the summer. Kyogo is going to leave in the summer. Joe Hart's retiring. That's four massive players that you've got to replace. We still haven't properly replaced Jota. So, realistically, five players in the summer. Do you think you're going to get a budget to replace five players in the summer? No. We need an upgrade at left-back. Taylor looks derived of all confidence. So, I mean... 
probably need a centre back as well. Seven players. This is the thing, oh. like the yeah, the hypothetical thoughts of who and Eda's only on loan. Eight players. Oh, is he only on loan? I thought he got him permanently. Eight players, man. <laughs> yeah. You think and the drop out you think the drop off's bad now? The summer it, this, could... is, this is literally what I was saying. As uh, scared as I am this season, what I am scared of now is that we are in a transitional phase. It's going to take two years to fix. Yeah, because uh, putting all the, putting all those things, and obviously, you know, attack leaving isn't a certainty. Kyogre leaving isn't a certainty. But I would say it's probably eighty twenty. I, I would I would be amazed if they're still at the football club. Kyogre can't get in the national team, and he's struggling now that Adam Eden's coming to get in our team. There's no way he's staying. Does he go to some big Premier League club? No, but I imagine if we got offered four million for him to go back to Japan, he would want that move because one, he's going back to play every single game, and he will get in the national team. It's a huge thing for him. It's massive, and he's seeing Hatati and Maeda off. They go to the Asian Cup, and he's left out. It's a World Cup qualifying pe- campaign coming up. He's going to want to be a part of that. So you know, if he's not young, he's not getting any younger. It's not like he's a kid. If he was off, if we were off four million, Anki would want to go. And you say we'd never accept that. Case in point, we did it for Carl Starfoot. We wanted to leave the club. We accepted four million. Leo Labarda, whatever you think of him, and it's pretty controversial between Celtic fans at the moment. We're about to we're about to finalize a ten million pound move to him to go to the MLS. This was someone that was on the next gen list, and so with ten MLS. million pound, ten million pound, he's he's about to go. So. <sighs> Like, I would, and if we get to the summer and say, I don't know, I'm trying to think, <coughs> say Leeds go up or Southampton go up, and maybe Southampton because they've had success of it before, Wanyama, Fraser Forster, Van Dyke, Stuart Armstrong, and they go, wouldn't mind taking Cameron Carter Vickers, and they come up and offer us 15 million. Do you think Celtic say no to that? Not a fucking chance. No, absolutely not. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you, mate. I really don't know, man. Like it's <laughs> to think of what state this club will be in, in six months' time will be very frightening. I hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Absolutely. And I, yeah. and I hope someone clips it up and tells me that I have no fucking clue what I'm talking about. But. We've seen this pattern before at Celtic. We see it building towards the 10 season where we were just giving Scott Brown another contract. Lustig was just getting another year, you know, and we wasn't we wasn't being proactive and we wasn't making the moves. Ange Postacoglu come in and had to sign whatever. It was something stupid, like 14 players. And we're back in that same mould. Yeah. We're back in that same mould where someone is going to have to come in and potentially sign eight or nine players, which then kind of puts a cap on, you know, the the maximum you can spend. And Ange had a market that he could tap into where he could pluck Kyogo, Hatati, Maeda, bring these boys in, you know, f- for a low cost because he was he was moving into an unknown market. That will not be the same. That will no, not be the no, same. Because we're to go back and do it again with Awata, Kobayashi, Yang. And none of them are good enough. No. So that market is dead. You're gonna have to let it you're gonna have to let it fucking regenerate and come back to fruition before you go back out there. And we're gonna have to look in other places and you're not gonna get you're not gonna be able to just spend four million pound. And I know that people are talking about Matt O'Reilly and how much he costs and all right, there is always an exception. Fair play, there is always an exception. But on average you're not gonna be able to go and spend four million pound and and keep getting people that come in at league winning level. No, exactly. That was just something that Ange had in him. Like, regardless, like if even if it wasn't a J Lee, he struck gold with Matt O'Reilly. With the the recruitment setup at the moment, they haven't been able to repeat that same success Ange has had with particular players. Where he's had Kyogo come wrong. in, he's had Yotta come in, Abada. Celtic, so he, he still got it wrong, right? He he signed Burnaby, he signed Kobayashi, he signed fucking James MacArthur or McCarthy, sorry. On a fucking four-year deal or five-year deal, whatever it was, fucking madness. Mm. James McCarthy had a five-year deal, and we're wondering I bet why he's he on big wages up. as well. Well, see, is he come he, he come from the Prem? I think. Fuck knows where he come from. It seems he's so probably, long ago. He's that he probably might. still in the books, or probably. Well, he was. He was at Everton. Was it? Wigan, was Everton. it Wigan before Alex. or after 
Everton. Uh, I think it was before. I'm pretty sure it was before as well. It may yeah. well have been Everton. Yeah, you know what I mean, and you know, so look, it it went wrong under Ange as, as well, but he also had, like you said, Jota, Hatati, Kyogo. This is the thing. Go Hart, Cameron Carter, Vickers, Juranovic, Johnston to a, to a degree. I mean, he's an he's an okay player. He's not he's not utterly shot. Well, Ange got the best out of him initially. He's, he's an okay player. Leo Labada got good numbers. Um, Although I think he was left lacking in, in in many areas, but he got he got good numbers. But yeah, look, and signed. You know, that's when you're bringing in all these players. You know, there are going to be people that that fall short, but more often than not, you know, he he he, he brought in someone that was going to affect the squad. Some of the, I mean, some of the boys are bringing. They're just never going to get anywhere near the squad. And he did have those. You know, the Iraguchi and, and boys like this just were nowhere near it. But yeah, like some of the signings, like that Quan that's he's out alone at St Mirren now, but I, I doubt he'll ever get a game for us. Um But was it Iraguchi that you sold back to the Japanese uh, the J League yeah. as well? Yeah, I mean Yeah, so and Celtic have had a, a cycle of this isn't this isn't a Brandon Rogers thing. Celtic have a cycle of doing this, like Albin Albion and a Yeti you know, people that we signed that are just not on it. And we Miku. signed decent money. You know, Derek Barrichter that was kicking about the club for God knows how long. Derek you know, Barrichter. you had um, Bolongoli that was floating. I don't even, I think he's technically off the books, but no, the scary I think he thing is. Off the, yeah, he was the one that fucked off on squad. holiday during well, oh, quarantine, you, wasn't it? Yeah. When you look at the squad and you see some of the people that are still on the books, it's petrifying but it's it's been something that has happened over and over and over again and obviously you know Mark Laurel is is leaving um, and we're going to bring someone else in but um, it's a massive job if Brendan is here past us I, I'd be I'd be amazed yeah but I don't know mate we I feel like we've just got to take it a week at a time at the moment before your head explodes um, Livingston at home up next. What are your thoughts? Dave and Martindale looks like a pissed off smart, even no colour on it. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they're going to low block something that we've struggled to break down all season. Um, they're going to have five at the back. They're going to park the bus. They're going to be big. They're going to be strong, which is something that Liam Scales deals with quite well and, and plays more into more into the the physicality of the game rather than the technical side. That's where just weird struggle. Normally they've rooted to the bottom of the fucking table. I think still. I know they. I think they got. They've had a couple of results. But I have, I'm pretty sure they're still bottom Aren't of the Ross table. Ross County still at the root of the table. Or? Well, maybe Ross County are, mate. But I, I, I know that Livingston were. No, sorry, Dundee. One of them. I don't know. I can't. I can't remember. I mean, uh, especially don't... after you battered them by seven Dundee are having a, Dundee are having a decent season. It but, might be but, Ross you know, County then. Now, Livingston, yeah, Livingston's still bottom with 17 points. So, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty disconnected from the rest of the group. By far the worst team in the league this season, and they play on a shite old plastic pitch. So, obviously, it's that Celtic part, but we know they're going to low block. You know, they're not going to do anything that's going to break the mould, and, and we've got to come out and... Um, and deal with that and and break that down. Which the good news is, we you know Adam Eder is a is a big presence. He holds the ball up well. He's good in the air, um, which obviously we see in the Dundee game. We see in the game at Motherwell. So that adds an extra dimension. See it in the um, championship as well. Um, so yeah, I think that you know, touch wood and please Lord above, I think that should be a game that we navigate. Absolutely. And before we move on, just one last uh, thing to cover on the Central Premiership. And I guess it could come hand in hand with um, with the hypothetical thought of um, who would take over Brendan Rodgers if he was to be relieved of his duties in the summer. I mean, if he has a word with Sharon and he does well at Aberdeen... <laughs> Neil Warnock at the helm? Yay or nay? <laughs> He's. I think he's 
more inclined to go to the other side of Glasgow. That's where he's um lot he's lie and plus he's um he's doing rather shy to Aberdeen. Um maybe his eyes are being opened to uniqueness of Scottish football. Um but no, I mean Aberdeen as well. Look, it, look, it's going to be fun for you for the next couple of months. You're going to have some great clips and interviews, but you're struggling to finish in the top six. So do not make that man a permanent manager. Um, just he's in for the interim. Do your due diligence. Get someone in, um, and you know come back stronger next year. Well, I always but... wanted to manage in Scotland. Are you with me? <laughs> right. Well, it, he won't. He won't after you know, arguably the third biggest team in in Scotland, obviously behind the two the two Glasgow clubs. I don't, there isn't really, I don't think, many that would debate it. I'm sure there's probably a few, but for me, they're the third biggest club, and you know, the results haven't been good enough all season. Whether it's Barry Robson, whether it's Neil Warnock, they've had a really really poor season, um, which is disappointing because they've had some they've had some great results in Europe. You know, they they did yeah, quite well. Yeah, they did. In, they, a tough group, um, but they're, they're struggling to make the top six, which is you know a massive worry because really Aberdeen should be fighting for third, and obviously that third spot guarantees European group stage football. Um, so it's huge now. Um, so th- that's where they should be, and you know they're they're well well short of the of the mark. So. Um, I think they could even look at um, what's it? Um, what's his name? I know that Aberdeen fans, if there was any listening, would, would probably cringe and say it because it's the same kind of pattern that Jim Goodwin come in for, and he wasn't successful. But I think it's Stephen Robinson, the guy that's in charge of St Mirren at the moment, doing really, really well. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would be one from sort of within. Our demographic, you know, in terms of the, the Scottish membership, that I think would be a good appointment. Um, but yeah, they, they've got a lot. They've got time. You know, they've got time on their side to, to get get people together, inquire, find the right person to take them forward, and yeah. hopefully they will come back. I did. I did see there was a few wild names that were floated around. I see Wayne Rooney was floated. <laughs> Yeah. That was, a bit, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a bit um, a bit out of the box. Um. So, uh, I think you know that, that those kind of names being floated is is good for Scottish football because you know five years ago would a would an up and coming manager have taken the Aberdeen job or been linked mm. even with the Aberdeen job? I, I don't think so. Um, I don't and, think you'd want Wayne Rooney anyway because he'll obviously do what he did with Birmingham, go on a bad run with them. Get sacked and then cry about it on a podcast. So, I, I think Birmingham's just a horrible club, mate. Like, yeah, they, they are. You know, the fact that you know, what what he expressed and what they done to John Eustace. Uh, like, well, they've done he, in the past as well. Like, I always bring up Gary Rowett in the past. Like, they yeah. honestly, I, how that club is run is just absolutely despicable, and their fan base is utter fucking scum as well. <laughs> Well, you're not going out for a drink in Birmingham anytime soon. Um, oh, no, skip, oh, no, skip. I'll take you back. <laughs> no fighting. No fucking no fighting. No fighting. No fighting. No fucking fighting. No fucking fighting. But, um... Yeah, um, he, he, he done all right with... I mean, this has gone on a tangent. This has veered off weirdly. But he done all right with Derby in the, the administration. I don't know what he done in the MLS... Um, but yeah, the, the Birmingham job is is a, a real tainted chance because on paper, when you look at Birmingham City, it doesn't look like a bad job. You know, St Andrews, decent sized stadium, decent sized fan base, a big city um, in Birmingham. Um, you know, passionate fans, but they've they've been so far off it for so many years. And then when they start to look like they're emerging, now you could say that where they were sitting in the table was slightly deceptive because it was so early on in the season. But to just bin someone that's in the playoffs and bring in Bruni and bin him after 15 games. And like you said, Gary Rowe up before. So, yeah, you know, I imagine that Rooney will get back into the game and, and 
maybe then we judge him because I think he did all right at Derby under the under no, the I think, I, think, yeah, I think he did a fantastic job at Derby considering the circumstances he had to work under and I think when it when it came to to League One and it just you know it just all went wrong he. You know, he he cut ties, went to the MLS for a bit, and then, like you said, it was a big job with Birmingham because they're one of those teams in the championship. And I know I've just slated them, but essentially they're one of them sleeping giants that were still awaiting to make it back into make it back into the top tier. Yeah, you know, it's, you know it, it, it seems like a long time ago, but it, it really wasn't all that long ago. You know, the the famous Oberfemi Martins moment where they win. The, the, the Carling Cup final, Cup. yeah, and you know they were playing in Europe in the Championship. What a unique story! And you know they were, you know, su- surviving relegations on on the last day, like Gary Gardner, Sebastian Larson, these these people that were that were there. I think Ben Foster was was he there as well? Ben Foster was point? there once upon a time. Yeah, I think I think that's so, probably I think that's probably where he had a a good season. I think I think that's where Joe Hart had. His big break as well, where he managed to come first choice at Man City, courtesy of his yeah. loan spell at Birmingham. Like, it's yeah, though Birmingham do offer quite a bit of um, football heritage in a weird and in, way. In, within within our within our lifetime, within our means, yeah, within our lifetime. I, I, I guess it's, football, it's yeah. you know people people that are maybe just a few years older than us would you know quantify Coventry City as a Premier League club because they. You know they they were there for the mainstay, and, and obviously they've they've dropped off and are coming back a wee bit now. Um, uh, under um, oh, I forget his name, but he's done a good job. I can't remember your name, but you've done a good job at Coventry. Um, so you know, there's those kind of teams where you know if you're talking to someone that was 18, 19, they were just you know, they're a Championship club, and that's what they've turned into. But you still have still have those things like Sunderland as well. Sunderland to me are a Premier League team. Like Sunderland, fifty fifty thousand seat a stadium is it, or in and around that the stadium a lot? Yeah, forty you fifty thousand. Yeah, again it's another something. huge club who in our lifetime who were so familiar with playing Premier League football, and then it just becomes like a it, you had to, you had to look twice at the League One table once upon a time seeing their name pop up there. I mean that Reading down there as well, now and Reading in a, down there, and yeah. at this rate, we could they could be staring in the face of League Two with with. Do you, remember, the, do you remember their first season coming up? Dave Kitson, Leroy Lita, like on the charge, like thinking they were going to get. I remember European Shane Long football. breaking my fucking heart in the playoff semi final. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Shane Long. Fucking hell! Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good and bad times. Sometimes right. maybe good, sometimes maybe shit. <laughs> <laughs> um. So it's mad, and you know the, the the cycle. And then you look at, and then you kind of are a bit dismissive of other teams as well. I mean, you look at Brentford and Bournemouth, and even though you know that they're, you know, they're established Premier League teams at this point, I always look at them at the start of the season and think, wouldn't it be surprised if you go down? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, like it's so weird with the mindset of us and the mindset of. You know, younger football fans nowadays, where yeah, exactly. You see the likes of Bournemouth and Brentford, who are teams that we've been so familiar with playing in the third tier of the English football pyramid, and they're, I mean, not quite Bournemouth, but Brentford are probably you know flying more high than Bournemouth are. But yeah, right. no, it's, it's it's crazy how times have changed and how ownership and getting the right management in can really dictate a club's progress and. Like you know, like we said, um, if you get it right, you get it right, and then you you see the likes of Thomas Frank flying high with Brentford, and then you have the likes of Birmingham high, the likes of Ray- Wayne Rooney, and they're 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 struggling for dear life at the moment. But but I, I think that's that's the transition. That's where we we swoop across the right man in charge. So bullets at the helm. Cardiff been up and down. But the last couple of weeks have been far better, culminating in heading on down to Bristol. And as we say, just like Cardiff, your city is blue. So I just needed to take an extra few seconds to, to get that out of me. Um, I was so excited to record this episode, I've already made the thumbnail. Whistles get battered. <laughs> <laughs> 
Everywhere they go, whistles get battered. Everywhere they go, everywhere they go. C C A C. Anyway, yeah, um, absolutely over the moon to do the double over those Wurzel bastards. Um, I think a lot of it was P- um, was PTSD from last season, where we had both our rivals do the double over us, and so one down, one to go. Um, Indeed. We meet the Jacks in a fortnight and hopefully we can repeat what we did this past Saturday. But, yeah, no, like I said at the start of the episode, um, it had it had been a tough month, pr- month prior to the last two weeks where, I mean, we, we beat Stoke last week and that was our first home victory of 2024. Our last home win was back in December against Millwall, which goes... Yeah, and again, like December is a long, long, long time ago from now, and so yeah, uh, it's been a mixture of playing the big teams at the top, and we've just been over, over, overwhelmingly outclassed by them. So the likes of Norwich, uh, Southampton, all the big names there, and um, who have just you know we've gone to their place and we've just been no match for them. Hull being another one as well, and so it was it was it was a lot to take in. Uh, we looked completely out out of character to what we saw uh, at the beginning of the season, where we played with a lot of attacking attacking directness and intensity, and it had all of a sudden become unfamiliar with us where we looked so timid playing out the back that teams were just on the front foot from the first whistle pressing the back line and forcing us into making errors and it feels like we've come out of our shells a bit more the past the past two fixtures uh, Stoke we came out the blocks quite early on I was sitting with you in the pub there Joel and we you know, we went we went 2 nil up within 20 minutes and then they got a consolation which was really a goal in one of those goals that you just you couldn't help defend anyway it was just one of those scenarios where the ball could have gone anywhere and it falls to their falls to their striker who puts it into an empty net but and then yeah then we had we really had to dig deep at Ashton Gate on Saturday uh, the opening 20 minutes was a lot of hard work for us where we had to throw bodies in the way and just divert any danger that came towards even Horvath's goal and and then of all people uh, David Turnbull previously on the books of of Celtic who we we brought in for a small fee of, t- of two million pounds on deadline day uh, whips in the corner and onto the head of my superstar and my player of the season for the second year in a row, Perry and G, to score the one and only goal to give us the three points at Ashton Gate and seal the double over those tractor shaggers, which was fantastic. And um, no, it's put, it's put us in a good place. I, I, how I could describe Cardiff's situation at the moment is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We're not quite out of there yet because we're now at that time of the season where there's only about 10 15 games remaining uh, we've got tough fixtures coming up and the relegation scrap is massive at the moment and I'm talking from 12th 13th from the table all the way down to 23rd from Watford who are just below us all the way down to Sheffield Wednesday I'm I'm gonna rule out brother not because I slated them for having you know because their pitch always gets waterlogged when there's a bit of light drizzle down there or that they're just a dead club full stop um, I think they were doomed from the start anyway they they were very fortunate to stay up last year in my, in my opinion but I'm almost certain that they'll go down I think the gap between them and Wednesday is just far too great for them to make any sort of revival this season but bar Rotherham there is a there's a lot of fine margins between us at the moment and you know but then looking from where we are on the table where we're 11th at the moment we're nine points off the playoffs I'm not saying we're gonna 
make up that nine point difference and be challenging with the likes of Hull and West Brom who are who are the closest we could catch at the moment because Southampton, Leeds, Ipswich and Leicester are running away and it's a four horse weight race between them. And and so my my hope with with Cardiff now is that we can just avoid being dragged into that scrap because we drop any points and then teams below us like like, like I said the likes of Watford or QPR or Stoke even Bristol City now uh, the Jacks it feels like if we lose one game and one of them pick up three points we're instantly in that in that in that battle and so you know, I we mean, go. We we go. You know, we have Huddersfield tomorrow night. Feels and that feels like a massive game. That's a huge a game because, because Huddersfield have been playing fairly well as of late. Yeah, obviously they've had the new guy coming from Germany, formerly of Schalke. Yep. Um, and um, obviously decent pedigree. I think Huddersfield um are very excited about that appointment um, and we'll see how he gets on obviously they've had good history with it the likes of david wagner doing very well at the at the, at the, the their football club um and they got a positive result um against leeds as well who have been yeah. you know by and by the, the form team of the championship but why i say it's a huge match because once you get past that you've hit switch at home who are flying you've yep. a, you've derby at the liberty which in years gone by has been not a nice fixture um you've Sunderland who are towards the top end you've Coventry that are towards the playoff pitcher you've Hull towards the playoff pitcher Birmingham away which you know I think we, we highlight that as a yeah, potential three yeah. points after everything we've said Millwall away <laughs> Millwall away is a really weird game because every time I watch Millwall at the den even though the, the league position says that they're shite and they are but at the den they're, they're a different proposition um, might be a wee bit different when you come to town. I don't know how full it gets, but certainly, you know, if they can get that crowd going, yeah. they're a strong. Well, home. I mean, yeah, I've I've been, yeah, I've done it in person when, obviously, I mean, it was <laughs> once upon a time when we were on a promotion charge, but um, no, um, they do they do pack that place out when when we come to town, and then again, so do we, and it's um, no, it's it's quite a hostile atmosphere, and it's a very physical game yeah i mean Very we're physical game possible. you're you're like you're yeah. really you're really in the trench trenches when it comes to Millwall at the den and then you finish with southampton which are obviously um flying high middlesbrough who have had a, a poor season but are certainly still a decent team yeah and then obviously finish away at rotherham so really you've some you've some high flying team now there'll be twists and turns there'll be results that we don't expect but if i was being uber critical of where of games that i think you'll struggle um you know ipswich i think you'll struggle i the think derby is... will come back to haunt us in that game so ipswich will struggle the derby is a is a coin flip as it is most times yep. that, that you play um Sunderland are a good team, Coventry are a good team, Hull are a good team, you know, Millwall away. It's definitely a winnable game, but it's going to be a tough Southampton, a good team, Borough, a good team, and Rotherham. So really you're looking basically Rotherham, Millwall, Birmingham, Huddersfield, where if you maximise there and then look at the other games and say, look, if we, you know, you could definitely go to the Liberty and win. You've beat them already once a season. Swansea are not having a great season. No. Um, you know, they've already um, ditched one manager. Um, so it's not like they're flying either. But, you know, there's some real tough games meshed in and around there. And I mean, like you said, you're, you're at 11th, you're on 47 points. If you maximise that and you end up on... 59. I don't think it obviously would be nowhere near enough for playoffs, but it'll be nowhere near relegation either. I, I think as as it stands now, with Huddersfield on 38 and Hughes on 47, and the way that the, that the season is structured, I don't think Hughes will get dragged into that dogfight. But yeah, and I can I can see what you mean by there are. It's going to be very fine margins to say the least and no, it, it really does amplify the importance of the game tomorrow against Huddersfield 
And I just really hope, I mean, if Errol Bullock can take that momentum that we took from the Stoke win into a derby, get three points at Ashton Gate, and then go into that Huddersfield game, take three points, I'd settle for a point against Ipswich. Personally, yep. I'd personally settle against a point with Ipswich. I think that as long as we manage to maintain that standard and take that same approach as we did against the Wurzels, we can, I think we can do the Jacks over. But I think, again, I think I if you carry this momentum into the Huddersfield game and beat Huddersfield, even if you take a step back and Ipswich come to town and batter you 3-0, which is, which is a, a possibility. On this season, you know, they, they have some, some, Really, really good players, and like I said, they've added to that in Kiefer Moore um, as well. Um, but even the likes of Broadhead, they've that Broadhead, they got that Al Hamadi who they signed from Shrewsbury as well. Yeah, they've, they've the winger as well. I forget, I forget. He's both flanks. I think are pretty decent. But yeah, anyway, they oh, got they got two good wingers. Like, I mean, they they just look absolutely outstanding yeah. this season. Ipswich, and the fact they've managed to maintain their place in the table where they are at the moment has been unbelievable. Ultimately, yeah. ultimately, I personally think, just purely because I think they have got the most dangerous team in the Championship this season and that they've been on such a ruthless run as of late, barred the Huddersfield game on the weekend, I think Leeds will... I think I can see Leeds toppling Leicester. I don't know why. I could see Leicester just falling short of Leeds. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good point. I mean, they went to Chelsea and, and give a really good account of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Um, you know, some they, they do have some really, really good players. You know, the likes of Somerville, um, that Guanonto is it on on the wing as well? Yeah, Willie Nonto. Uh, so, yeah, like you said, Somerville, Ampadu's been unbelievable this season. Dan got, James, who's been unreal. Bamford. Patrick Banford. Um, there's definitely still names that we're missing there. Yeah. Um. So you know that they've they have a good chance. I think I think Leicester and Leeds will be Ritter as well, who they spent yeah. thirty million pounds on. I found yeah. out the other day. Championship club. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like... So yeah, they'll they'll be it'll be it'll be good. It'll always will be. I'll make for interesting playoffs as well. You know, the, the playoff season is is always fun to to watch and enjoy and see the passion in those games and having those teams so close. Um, but I'd, I would be gutted for Ipswich to, to deliver the way that they have, you know, wedged in between the Leicester, Southampton, Leeds, you know, that relegation trio to be wedged in there is a fantastic. I'd be gutted for them if they, if they don't make it. But, you know, that, that's talking sort of with, with the heart and your head kind of says, look, Southampton and Leeds have such such strong teams yeah. for this level. That Absolutely. Expect- yeah, when they, when they hit the ground running, they really set the they really did set the pace for this league and the fact that Ipswich as a newly promoted side that have managed to compete with them I think you know yeah it it would it'd be crushing to see them fall short at the end of the season but at the same time still still a great story to tell manager of the year if if they get playoffs manager of the year for the Ipswich boss Uh, absolutely 100% there's yep. no, there's no question about it. There's honestly no question about it. You could, yeah, I know you could obviously say, um, what's it? I can't remember the Leicester manager, Marega Villega. I can't remember his name. The of M, didn't it? Um, it Marega, is it Marega? Yeah, Enzo, Enzo, um, Maresca. Maresca, Maresca. Sorry, Maresca. Enzo Maresca because of how long Leicester have managed to hold down top spot. Daniel Fark, who's obviously managed to get the best out of this lead side. Um, Russell Martin can get straight in the fucking bin. Dirty Jack can't fucking. Liam, um, what's it? Liam Rosnia? The... Liam Rosnia, the whole boss, yes. Yeah. I think, you know, whole, whole one of these, again, one of these strange clubs that you still kind of um, equate to Zaki and Bullard and, you know, that. You know, oh my David Myler. I'm just scrapping Alan Pardew on the touchline. I, I mean, and, um, Phil Brand sitting them down at the eight head and giving them the old finger wag. Um, so yeah, they're one of these teams that have come down and have got stuck, which is a 
is a common theme. It's no it's no mean feat to do what Leicester are doing and what Leeds are doing and what Southampton are doing. You know, by bouncing straight back and being in that playoff mix because you know you, you can get stuck with and it with plenty of clubs. You know, Sunderland and and Leeds for for a while. You know, they were down for what was it fifteen years. You can get stuck, so it's no mean feat doing what they're doing. And Ipswich doing fantastic, but Hull looking to have a, a, a mini resurgence as well, which is... Yeah, yeah. I, I, like I said, I still heavily back them to be in playoff contention by the end of the season. West Brom, I think, have done really well. And like this is not me plugging West Brom for the sake of Richard. <laughs> I'll say his name. Um, but no, again, I mean, West Brom, I think they've got one of the highest goal differences in the league at the moment, outside the top four. So we can't disregard the, the progress that... Um, Love them to go up as well. That Wolves and game was tasty. And... Yeah, exactly. Oh, 100%. Oh, God. If we get a repeat of that FA Cup fixture, I'll <laughs> take it all day and every day. The Black Country Derby would be yeah. great. Have them them. Yeah. And and then, and then there's one thing that I will mention, which I don't know if you'll, you'll take a liking to, but, I, I mean, initially, I didn't realise that Mikey Johnson had joined West Brom. And I must say, and you're going to hate this, He's doing well at the moment. I mean, I think it says more about the league than it does the player. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was going to say, uh, Nat think... Phillips doing really well at the moment. I don't, th- I don't think it's a glowing reference for the championship in terms of the it's quality. It's really not. It's really it's... not. No, I know. Because a lot of people... So I think what the championship is is incredibly um, great to watch. It's incredibly entertaining. Um, the fact that Rotherham, that are having such a shit season, could go and beat Leicester. It's unlikely, but it, but it could happen. Mm. Um, there isn't that kind of monopoly that there is in the likes of La Liga and, 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 other, and other places. It does really have that. And, and that's what English football does really, really well. You know, there is a, a real competitive edge um, to it. But a lot of people would have you believe that the championship is, you know, full of incredible teams. And the fact that Mikey Johnson has turned up that couldn't do it in the Scottish Premiership while he was playing for the biggest club in the Scottish Premiership and he couldn't do it and he was playing against the Dundees and and he couldn't do it and he's gone down to West Brom and he's lining it up. It's not a glowing reference for for the Championship. The fact that... Well, let's just say scoring within 30 seconds against Cardiff is certainly not a glowing reference either. (laughs) And, and I know where the rebuttal will be that Adam Ida couldn't hit a barn door in the championship and he's gone up to um, to Scotland and he's five in six or whatever he is now after not scoring on the weekend. Fair enough. That's not a, it's not a, a glowing reference for Scottish football either. Point in case. Taken. But what you've got to also consider with that reference is that Adam Ida is playing for, again, the current champions of Scotland go out. so he is going to get more chances Johnson hasn't gone down there and gone to Leicester who were the, the runaway leaders at one point he's gone to West Brom a playoff team so alright he's playing in the, the, the top echelon but to, to be to be doing that I mean I've, I've, ne- I've never seen him play like that in his life no I've never only said with career absolutely so, not West Brom, let's let's get around the table and tell us how much you're going to buy him for. <laughs> let's make the deal now. I was going right. to say, right now, what are you asking for? Now, now, now yeah. is the time. To get well, we, the table. well, we took David Turnbull off your hands permanently, so yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. you were happy with the two million you got. And uh, to be oh, honest, like we I mean, when when I look at his record on paper, like I was quite surprised because he had contributed quite a lot of goals and assists for you. Like it was, like you said, your, your 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 main. I think your main criticism of David Turnbull was his work ethic in defensively tracking back and his press. I think game. I think that would be that would be pretty much everybody's criticism. There's no doubt the boy is yeah. a, a very good technical player. Scored plenty of goals from outside the box from us. Is a good dead ball. Um, uh, player as well, you know, good from free kicks, good from corners, but the you know the style that was being implemented under Ange, and you know a, a similar-ish kind of pressing style that's coming in Rogers just doesn't 
doesn't suit him. I don't think the boy would ever have come to the the football club if you know it wasn't Neil Lennon that, that was in charge because he just wouldn't have suited the 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 style. There's no doubt that he's you know got got talent. Yeah. Um, and we wish you know wish him all the best. Hope he does really well. You know, I hope he goes on to develop a work ethic. Um, and maybe Errol Bullock can put the rocket up his ass. That I think Brendan he already Br- has, to be honest. I really think he has. When he came on against Watford, I think he, yeah, he covered a lot of ground when he came on for that last twenty minutes. Maybe he's understood. You know, David Turnbull was at Motherwell, got his big move to Celtic, um, and it went it went okay. You know, it wasn't a flop. He didn't do terrible. Um, but I think he kind of understands in terms of his reputation within football, now that he's left Celtic and gone to the Championship and only gone for two million in the same kind of ilk as Ryan Christie did. Mm-hmm. And, you know, who the fuck gives a shit about Ryan Christie now? But this is his his chance, you know, to really go and display what he's got. Otherwise, he could just be compounded to be, you know, a top end League One player bottom end championship player because you know if Cardiff eventually say well no look you're not for us you you don't fit what we're trying to do then where does he go I think David Turnbull he does have a big ego and I think he will have to manage that ego because I see a world where in a week's time or a couple of weeks time sorry the podcast is being named the blue bird rises and Aaron Ramsey comes out like fucking the Dark Knight or Undertaker, and he's magically in the lineup for the South Wales Derby. Like, I tell you what, if that does happen, I'll be fucking fuming because he's he suffered another setback as well, not not surprisingly. And so, again, like that was that was very frustrating to hear because obviously he'd been on the sidelines for a good four to five months, and I really thought the time he'd come back. I don't know if they did rush him back just to try and get his match fitness up to a standard where he could play in the South Wales derby and play a good well, I think, I 60, think that's probably what, minutes. And I think, I, that, I think, I think they rushed him back. You know? aiming for. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's what he would be aiming for. I think if, they, if he can if he can take you got, you got to think, this is a player that has played through multiple injuries. Yeah. So he, he knows what his pain threshold is. I think even if you, if he gets to 50%, then he'll be saying you know, give me injections, put me on the bench, let me have half hour. And we've seen managers that, you know, are, are a wee bit desperate and, you know, are maybe thinking, you know, we re- we could really do have a result. Um, take that risk. We see it with Roy Hodgson and um, Alisi, you know, away at Brighton and brings in, brings on their star man. Um, and obviously he broke down. Um, but, you know, we have seen clubs that, that will take the risk and I wouldn't be surprised if, if Ramsey... Is, is named on, on the bench. But when he does come back, I think the problem that Turnbull will, will, will have to face is that there's a better player in front of him and, and he has to play the game. And he wasn't that good at doing that at Celtic when Rio yeah, had no, I think it's, it, it really is like trying to work out his best position at the moment because I think, I think a, a big factor that accommodates uh, Turnbull in terms of his playing style is that Siopis will do the pressing for him. What Turnbull adds to that midfield is balance because what we had prior to Turnbull coming to Cardiff was two players who would sit deep in the likes of Siopis, Rules and or Wintel and they would sit in the midfield and it would just leave us bare going forward where we'd have to go long out to the wings to Carlin Grant, to Josh Bowler, to Mate, Tanner, whoever it was who's starting. And it, there was no outlet behind Etete, for example, or that you know, or Jeju, who he brought in on loan. And what Turnbull does, we allow him to drift forward. We move Cole out wide, who I think is very effective on the left wing, and having Bowler on the right, or even if we put them the other way round and then put Carl and Grant on the left because he's in golf scoring form at the moment um, from the Stoke game. So I think. With his momentum going forward at the moment, I think he'd be a better outlet than Bowler. And yeah, but like I said, he brings so much balance to that midfield where it just doesn't. Otherwise, it feels like 
watching Wales where we play two holding midfielders and like Ampadu and Joe Morrell or um, Jordan James. I think Jordan James has been again he's been like the I the identical change we've needed with Turnbull at, at Cardiff where they where they just they cancel each other out where Siopas can drop, he can cover ground, break up play, dictate a ball forward, and then Turnbull can then push forward, support Colwell and Bala and Atete. And it worked it worked so well on the weekend and we've missed that for the last month. And so I, that and that's why I you know, I'm I was very I was really happy when we signed Turnbull. I think he came in and he was definitely the kind of character and midfielder that we needed to just add that balance that was that was lacking from the side. I think Nat Phillips, who's come in for McGuinness, who has been ruled out for a while now, uh, big big boots to fill, and I think he's come in and he's really formed a formidable partnership with Gutas, and he gets stuck in. He comes, he he looks comfortable playing the ball out of defence, which is quite surprising because, you know, when the last time I spoke to you about him, that he was just a, you know, you know, catastrophe, <laughs> catastrophic defender, and so, you know, there was that sense of doubt as to whether or not he was gonna, if he was gonna fit in or not. But of course, we had to, we had to reassure Liverpool that he was gonna get minutes, as we've only got him on loan, and he's come in and he's, I, I've got really nothing to complain about Nat Phillips at the moment. So I think, I think it, you know, again, it's a. a cons- uh... A comparison of styles, you know, Nat Phillips at Cardiff is probably defending ten yards deeper, and he hasn't exposed as I much. I think, yeah, I think I think the big uh, that's another big factor as well, where we play a deeper line than than Celtic do, and so that obviously obviously does factor into play as well. Like, you know, and th- and this is the thing, like I think you really do notice with with certain players how they fit into a, to a team system. Ek Ugbo, prime example. And he's been talking to town as you know as of late with Cardiff. This is a striker we had on loan for the first six months, and correct me if I'm wrong, he only contributed to four goals. He then went to Sheffield Wednesday on loan in January. He has now got a goal a tally of six goals already. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Which just sort of, you know, and a lot of people have jumped to the conclusion saying like, oh, we're a graveyard for strikers, and yeah, you can make that case with certain players. Like, I mean, Ugbo being an example, you could say it to Reese Healy, who went, who went to the second tier of France and bag bag twenty goals. You could say it to Bobby Glatzel, who went back to Germany and scored twenty of goals for Hamburg, but then. I mean, if you look at our past history with the likes of Kiefer Moore, who bagged 20 goals for us, Jay Boffroyd, who, who got a fucking England call-up for us, Michael Chopra, Ross McCormack, Paul Parry. Like, I, you know, like, I think that's... Cardiff... You Ernie. Know, Cardiff, Ernie, uh, yeah, if we're going further and further back, like, you know, that's always the, like, the... the dull side of being a City fan is just dealing with the just these fickle mindsets of how we could just jump to conclusions so quickly and be so narrow-minded about them. Well, but that's what happens, right? When, when success... You, you get with every club, though. You, do, you when, really with, do. When, when, when you have a successful period, which Cardiff definitely did, you know, in, in that stint where, you know, a couple of promotions to the Premier League and, you know, the, the, the fan base that comes in and... And then, you know, maybe the, the casual becomes a little bit more interested and then disinterested. And then, you know, they're giving their opinions. And, you know, when they were going to games, they were seeing Gary Medell and Stephen Corker and, and, and these kind of players. And, and now all of a sudden they're seeing what's, what's there at the moment. You know, they've gone from, you know, seeing Aaron Gunnison in midfield to, you know, trying to understand oh, at times. Yeah. <laughs> What was happening? So you, you can understand what success kind of breeds that. Um, but I think Cardiff have, have always had, you know, kind of from my memory, they've always had a pretty sharp attack. Um, this season, it's blunted a wee bit. Um, but you know, that tends to happen when you when you lose someone 
of the presence of of Kiefer Moore, it it becomes very very difficult to to replace mm-hmm. that player unless you're going to go out and spend, you know, quite a you know in championship terms. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you have to go out and spend quite a big sum of money. Yeah. Manchester Derby, I think that was the the big talking point this past weekend. Uh, Man City coming away with a three one victory over United. Um, actually, yeah, I watched that game as well. Uh, was certainly eventful with uh, United taking a surprise lead through Marcus Rashford. Yeah, I mean, cracking goal. Really Fair good play. goal. Really good goal. And I was joking prior to us coming onto the pod and saying that Foden's goal was better. Rashford, brilliant finish. Yeah. Um, yeah it, obviously, you hadn't seen it, but before Hambit had released that article, um, basically saying not to question his commitment um, because he had stayed at United. I, I don't know if that quantifies commitment in its essence. Like, fair enough, you've stayed and you've potentially been offered. I was going to say that. I don't, know, I don't know where the argument is valid there. Like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, he's been offered bigger wages elsewhere and could have left, um, and he's, he's stayed. Um, but I think, you know, commitment boils down to more, and I think the reason it's being questioned is certainly, you know, some of the... Um, body language that's been displayed on on the pitch would lead, I think, most fans to question whether or not you want to be at the football club. Some of the antics, um, you know, in in Belfast, going out in nightclubs. He was in, he was actually in Lavery's the day after. What I was a out fucking the shagger, eh? Uh-huh. Um, Go so... around a pool with him. <laughs> I play. I um... play in the loser has to take five tequilas. <laughs> He'd have probably been on for it the way. He'd yeah, he would have done. I want to smash the fuck out of it. <laughs> um, so, you know, those kind of things, and obviously off the back of that ringing in sick, um, there, there are things that um, that would lead people to to question um, commitment, especially when you, you listen to you know the standards that were set at United through the nineties into you know the early two thousands, and you know the people that are still a big heavy media presence now, Roy Keane and, and Gary Neville, you know, that talk about the standards that, that were set at that at that club, obviously yeah. under um Sir Alex Ferguson. So um you can understand why people would be be questioning that. But look he, he comes and he steps up. Apparently he wasn't fully fit, people were saying, and he and he's pushed himself through to play in the Derby and scored a scored a belt off. Um I did see I did see a clip from um, another podcast. I don't even know what you call it. Talk show, one of those watch alongs where there was clearly a Chelsea fan um, that was very pissed off that Gary Neville didn't call Man United billionaire bottle jobs, um, and he, he went on a bit of a rant. And the, the panel that was on with him didn't do really a good job at holding him to account because he was saying, why are Man United not billionaire bottle jobs? Why were Chelsea bottle jobs? Um, we didn't touch much on the Carabao Cup final, just in case this ever reaches his eyes. Well, oh, I mean, that... uh, as soon as you mentioned billionaire bottle jobs, I was going to actually bring that up on the agenda there. Yeah, I'll, I'll clarify the difference. Okay, um, so he, he said United United only had two shots and that makes them bottle jobs and Chelsea had six shots on target, 16 shots. No, that isn't what quantifies a bottle job. Okay, maybe we have different different definitions, but that isn't what quantifies a bottle job. United scored a goal and took the lead, yes, but were completely dominated and outplayed and succumbed to the pressure and were never really from an attacking force in the game. So they, didn't, they weren't a bottle job. They set up to be defensive and got broken down. They didn't really have many chances to bottle the game. Chelsea, on the other hand, had plenty of chances to bottle the game. And they did. And then went into extra time playing against Liverpool's... How many kids come on? Like, I didn't even know some of the players that were Honestly, playing. Honestly, the, the only players that I really recognised from that team who obviously feature a lot more predominantly than the rest of that starting eleven were probably Gakpo and Van Dijk. Yeah, and they they were saying, oh, look, they they lost to a Van Dijk header. It's hard, you know, he's a world class player. Blah blah blah. Okay, that's fair enough. But what you're what you're doing there is you're very tactically homing in on one moment 
in the 30 minutes of extra time because the other moments were played against a bunch of kids and you didn't do anything and you bottled the game. United, who I absolutely no affiliation to and I don't, don't give a shit if they win or lose, they didn't bottle the game because they were up against literally... And yeah, look, they've spent a lot of money and blah, 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 and they have a high wage bill and it should be better. Yeah, fair enough. That, that's, that's what you, you, you're absolutely correct. But they're up against the champions. They're up against the best team in the league for me. And they were dominated. Best team in Europe. Were, were they gutless? You could say that. Were, were they derived of any real confidence or attacking flair? You could say that. They didn't have enough chances to bottle the game. Rashford rockets one in from fucking 30 yards. Otherwise, Edison could probably have took the fucking afternoon off. It's not (laughs) bottling a football game. No, it really isn't. And they took the lead so early on. You know, they took the lead early on in that first half. By the way, on on the flip side, right? Yeah. If if in that cup final, Chelsea had scored in the 119th minute from a Conor Gallagher volley, right? Liverpool would also have bottled the final. Yeah, no, I right? think so would. Because they both had those opportunities um, and and they both missed chances and then they've gone into extra time and, and they haven't. They, they were both have bottled it. Right, One grew, one shrunk. Gary Neville was getting a lot of stick and he hasn't had broad enough shoulders to, to stand up and say, no, he's bottled it. He was getting a bit of flack on his podcast from Roy Keane and Jamie Carragher kind of stood with him, which you'd imagine he would obviously be in the Liverpool fan. Um, but you know, Ian Wright was giving him a lot of harsh time saying that word bottle isn't nice. Righty, you want to sit this one out, mate? Because your fan base has rattled the word bottle round for the past fucking 20 years every time they're talking about Tottenham. Sit it out, mate. Sit. I like you, Righty. You, you, you know, good pundit. I like the way you come at things. It's time to sit this one out as, as an Arsenal fan. Right, whose fan base has rattled that word every time that they're they're playing Tottenham or Tottenham are doing anything. Or when Ar- or when Arsenal are leading the fucking league for two hundred and forty eight days and lose it. <laughs> Sorry, bottle it. So if we're using that term. You know, it's um it, it it's that that madness. But ultimately, um yeah, apart from a Rashford wonder strike, um, and then him not doing much else in the game, um City were Dominant and should have scored more. I mean, Erling Haaland. Yeah, they, 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 they. Oh, he misses an absolute. Oh, I cannot believe. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking. Yeah, less than six yards out, and he's managed to side foot that ball over. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Manchester derby goes the way that I think pretty much everybody expected it to. Yeah. Um, unless you're a delusional United fan, which there are plenty of. Oh, um, of course, there is. You know, especially when they've taken the lead, you you definitely feel, in a sense, you've got to see this lead out. But I think you've got to be more pragmatic and yeah, and and to, to, in in their defence, they probably were a wee bit more pragmatic than they've been in recent times. Um, but you've you've certainly got to be, you know, a little bit more switched on and, and making sure that you're getting back into shape and making it really difficult. Yeah. I don't know if they did that enough no. to, I th- to go I, to a place I think like... Onana was unfairly criticised for that second goal as well, where Foden drills it across goal and Onana gets fingers to it. But as a goalkeeper, it can... It Obviously, you know, not... <laughs> I know Onana is a, a professional and earns hundreds of thousands a week. But I think, I think in general, it is, it is difficult... For a keeper to get down that quickly, to keep a shot of you know of that pace and of that power out from the bottom corner, I I personally thought it was a bit hardly hardly done by the third goal is a complete shit show. Um, yeah, so so Nana things and any time he does anything, he's yeah. This is the thing I don't I didn't I didn't get the the harsh treatment towards him because I think like it's always hard for a keeper to get down low that quickly to palm a ball of that pace out like it yeah I think that was absolutely ridiculous I think that was an, just another another bit of ammunition to use towards Onana based on his performances throughout this entire season and yeah, yeah I, I felt that was really harsh because Foden picked out that bottom corner perfectly and then yeah like I said the third goal 
stupidly give the ball away on the edge of their box, ball slot the Haaland and yeah, you you're gonna bet you're gonna bet your house on them scoring that regardless, you know, <laughs> excluding that that miss earlier in the game, but and so he got his compulsory one goal. It is, you know, he gets he gets yeah. his his moment after shit in the bed. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the, the, I couldn't I couldn't see anything but a City win, and you know, even even when it was one 0 at half time, I don't think even if it, 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 speaking to most neutrals, and you know, maybe City fans were getting drawn into some of the chances they missed, and they were getting panicked. It was the derby, blah blah blah. But I think most neutrals were. No, fairly I, was, I was watching it with Keen. I said that you'll you'll come back and win this. You definitely come back and win this. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. Sometimes you get drawn into that narrative, don't you? But I'm pr- I'm pretty sure that yeah. um yeah, most people were confident that they were going to do that, and and they did. No. In in all honesty, I, pretty comfortably. I think I think it was after the Haaland miss where, you know, I guess I guess a lot of City fans would have thought it's going to be one of these games where, you know, every chance that comes our way, it's just not it's not going to hit the back of the net, and so yeah. rightfully so. But then yeah, Foden picks out an absolute peach, brings them back into the game. And they they maintain that control with that encouragement. They get forward, break them down, Foden find space in the box, gets his shot across goal perfectly, puts them two one up, and then at that point, United are in two minds as to whether or not they they go and seek an equaliser or they hold the lead they've got and say that oh well it was only it was only it was only two one not six one. Yeah, it's just <laughs> shocking state that they're in. That that that's what yeah. they've, they've come to. You know. yeah. um, but what, what do you think of like the the league table situation at the moment? Do we do we feel like obviously we we've always backed Man City to chase down the teams in front of them, so the likes of Liverpool and and Arsenal, whoever it is. Um, do we see them doing that again, or do we feel that Liverpool have it in them? To I mean, I mean, with Liverpool's result against Forest this weekend, which sparked a lot of controversy at the end. Oh. Jesus Christ! 99th minute winner from Darwin Nunez. Complete yeah, um... shit. Completely hit the fan at the end and the game, mm-hmm. including Nottingham Forest's owner coming onto the pitch. I, know, I thought we were going to get. Sounds like very Bulgarian league esque, doesn't it? Like. Turkey, mate. Let's let's not throw well, the Turkey, Bulgarian. Well, no, the no, because they do they do the fucking same shit as well. They would come on for <laughs> gun if it was Bulgaria, but like, yeah. <laughs> oh Jesus! Um, Fuck it, 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 <laughs> it did feel very, did feel very Turkey esque. Um, I love how. <laughs> Of how the ref showed him a red card. So what so Maddie gets red card, I so watch it from the stand. What's he gotta watch it from now? He's 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 suspended now, he's gotta watch it from his living room, he's not allowed in the crowd. Fuck Imagine the steward steward trying to tell the owner, no mate, you can't come in today. <laughs> You're suspended. Oh, someone Point walking into your gaff, red card you can't be here. <laughs> Alright. Um Yeah, just look it comes back down again and we've spoken about it time and time again about you know the officiating, and it, it's just and, and like it's it's a it's a worldwide problem. It isn't it isn't just you know, but it's you know Scotland and England. I mean, I don't know if you see the Real Madrid moment where Bellingham scores in the last minute and the refs blown the whistle was he, Real Madrid. Is that what he got a straight for? Because he, he he said something to the ref and he was you know delicate little flower and sent him off. Um, but yeah, the ref's blown the final whistle was Real Madrid across in the ball. Uh, and then obviously Bellingham hasn't heard it and he's headed it in and the final whistle's gone. They run off celebrating and the game's over. But, you know, it's it's this it's this level of, you know, just complete incompetence, you know, of not understanding the game, uh, you know, and it has massive implications. You know, Liverpool scoring then keeps them top, but also takes a point off a of Nottingham Forest, who are in an absolute dogfight. Mm-hmm. Right, so that point yeah. could be massive to them, to, to whether they stay up or, or to whether they go down, especially with, you know, all the background noise and the charges that are floating over their heads. You know, they could quite easily lose 10 points. And then every point that they gain is absolutely huge. So, I mean, it's, it's utterly unforgivable. 
And I know that there's there's a lot of arguments to say well there was two minutes between him giving the ball back and um, Liverpool going up the other end and scoring. It's like, right, that's that's fine. But ultimately, what he's done is given Liverpool possession and given them you know uh, the ability to attack when really they should have been defending. And from from that they've built up on you know gone through transitions of play, but they shouldn't have been in those transitions of play anyway. No, the transition shouldn't have happened in the first place. And that's ultimately so, what that leads to the goal. And, you know, hopefully Liverpool fans now can shut the fuck up about the Tottenham game, right? And take it on the chin to realise that, you know, sometimes you're fortunate with these absolute morons and sometimes you're not. So, you know, it's mm. game on. Title race on. I still think City are the best team um, do Liverpool have it in them? Yes. Will they have a different kind of energy because of you know the Klopp announcement? I think so. Um, and looking forward to City Liverpool. I think it's City a couple of weeks. Liverpool this weekend. Yeah. Oh, this Big weekend. Crunch game this weekend. Huge, huge game. I feel you know City go there obviously off the back of um, the derby win um, and Liverpool scoring late. You know and it, they'll be buoyant about it. Um, so yeah, massive, massive game. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And if they draw, then you know the, the winners are down in North London as long as they do the business. So exactly. um, exciting title race. Um, I think Arsenal were better a better stood this year. A year on, they've had a year of experience. Liverpool are playing for a man that you know has been huge in their recent history. Um, and knowing it's his last season, and City are just the inevitable force. That, that always that always seem to come and, and, and get it done. So um yeah, pick your pick your beast. Um I think if I was you know, if I had a hundred pounds who you're gonna put it on, I still think it's difficult to put it not on City. Well an interesting statistic that I was told uh earlier today, Pep Guardiola has never won at Anfield. Oh, well, there's there's the omen. He's so definitely there's your hundred that. quid if you want to change your mind. <laughs> You've absolutely put the scot on it. There we go. City are going to rock up there and win four nil. Yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. But I mean, and then like you said, you know, Arsenal being the other title race contender, and they. Well, I mean, I don't even know why Sheffield United even bother showing up last night, but uh, shipped six goals to the Gunners at Bramwell Lane. Mm-hmm. A team that is in real trouble, and uh, probably yeah, are definitely odds on favourites to be back in the championship next season. Oh, they're down. They're yeah. Down. yeah. All, all we've got to hope for now is that Sheffield Wednesday do enough to stay up, so we get to, to see a, a, a still city. Come on, that'll be, Wednesday. That'll be that'll be good. That'll be that'll be a game that I am um, that, that I tune in for. So let's hope they. They get enough done, um, but yeah, Sheffield United are relegated, and they could go. <laughs> I think they're going to go down as like the worst. They're on track to go down as the worst defensive team ever. So they won't. They won't break that derby points. Not, not the up. points yeah. record, but I that think was, is it goals record. conceded? Yeah. yeah. And do you know who's second worst behind them? Behind who? Sheffield United. Sheffield United. Uh, who is second behind them? Who is it? Manchester United. Wow. Mm-hmm. That is an Owen Wilson. Wow. That is that is that's some serious levels of shyness. I no, honestly, trust me, they they didn't even cross my mind. I thought Luton. I thought teams in the past like Ipswich, Sunderland, even Newcastle when they were going through a bad. Pitch. Oh, well, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if maybe. Their potential. I mean, this season. Oh, Sheffield just United this season. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That's, that's not. That's oh not God, not I thought we were going yeah, way, so, way back. Like, no, no okay, but, yeah, no, so this season. Sheffield United on to be the worst ever, but in terms of this season, who's second on them in the Premier League in terms of goals conceded? It is Man United. Yeah, that's my, that's shocking. One of, one of my mates from work is going over this weekend with his with his boy to see the Everton game. That's some that's some weird form of. Horrific abuse there, and it like dragging him along to see that. Um, but we'll we'll see. I fancy Everton. Sean Deitch, Deitch ball. Bit of Deitch ball. I mean, I mean, um, it's a it's a weird situation with Everton at the moment, where 
Is it twice now they've been deducted ten points? I don't think they've been. I don't think they've had a second deduction. Did, either, that, not, yeah. did that not come into play then? Not, I know there was not, a lot. There was a lot of yeah, talk about it. They've been this. charged again, I think, but they haven't had. Another okay, point, okay. So they haven't actually been. And I mean, realistically, they need to do it now. Like, you, you can't deduct these guys ten points with like five games to go. That's ridiculous. You're just basically compounding. Mm. Well, they've done it before. Done it. I, mean, I mean, I know obviously it's different with the Championship and the Premier League. I know they did that with Reading with a matter of games to go last season, and that is what ultimately kept Cardiff up in the first place. And so, but like you said, yeah, it has to be it has to be swiftly brought upon for them yeah, to, to be deducted to be points. Stopped. Yeah. Right. Is there is there anything else for us to? Well, I was gonna, well, I was I was gonna sort of um, gloss over like the whole Chelsea situation with them being the bottle jobs of the Carabao Cup, and they they were they they weren't really bottle jobs. I mean, they've been bottle jobs since the start of the season because they, like you said, they spent billions on all these so wait, players. Wait, wait. Just, and like, just to clarify, you've gone. They weren't really bottle jobs. They've been bottle. Jobs. So do you think they're bottle jobs or do you think they're not bottle jobs? <laughs> I was trying to sort of expand the bottle job period. That's what I meant. And um, no, it wasn't just the final. It's been this entire season. And of course, they've had they've had their ups where they've, you know, they've had. I mean, I know Conor Gallagher has been a massive outlet for them. I know that, you know, certain players like Mudrick, who's had his moment. He's had. They've, there's been Nicholas Jackson, who's had his moments. Enzo Fernandez. Cole, Cole Palmer's been their has been their best outlet this season, but with all that money they've spent, don't get me wrong, they'll win everything on Football Manager. <laughs> but this season, you know, and as cl- big as a club Chelsea have that you know, have been the last twenty, you know, twenty fifteen twenty years, right? And the money they spent on all these so what world class players and going to be world beaters in three to four years time. They're the bottle. They're the bottle jobs of the Premier League. Complete. They're bottle jobs of the world, spending all this money, and they're sitting in tenth. I don't think I just, they have any. I think. I don't think they've recruited massively well, to be honest. No. I mean, uh, Mudrick is. I don't think he's liked by many Chelsea fans, and I think people are wondering why he's in such a long contract. But I think that echoes through most of the team. Um, Cole Palmer looks a. A decent signing, um, but you know they've been crying out for a striker and brought Nicholas Jackson. All right, um, I mean you look at that midfield and it should you know it should have so much more like Enzo Fernandez, World Cup winner, Caicedo, most expensive player in British transfer record history. Just look a bit meh. Raheem Sterling, you know. Was massive at City, multiple Premier League titles. Just looks a bit, and he hasn't met on at all. And I, I really thought he would be probably the, in terms of like winning mentality and character, he would have been the best individual, especially in that dressing room, to encourage all these young promising players to stand up and really make themselves counted in the season and push on. Like none of that has, none of that has been has been achieved whatsoever and like I said you know and this and they've just taken the complete wrong approach like I'm not saying they should have bought a load of old men they should have bought like you know I I, I personally thought Karen Benzema in the January window should have been one they should have looked at personally just to add that bit more experience I'm not talking you know I'm talking about across the board but you need to have that balance of European experience, like international competition experience, you need to have a blend of youth. I think I think the Benzema one that they've been burnt before. I think that that's probably we're looking back at historically. If we're looking at like Higuain, for example, so I think they've been they've been burnt before historically, and that's maybe what's deterred them from from that, and clearly. You know the the ethos behind the signings of the football club is clearly youth. Um, you know that, that famous saying was been tied around. You don't win anything with kids. Um, and I don't. Really, I mean, is Conor Gallagher a leader? 
I don't really think so. He's, he's done all right from the season. I think he's a leader. No. Ben Chilwell, a leader? No, not really. No. You know, Rich James? I don't know. I haven't really watched him enough, but I don't know. Um, Thiago Silva looks like a natural leader. Doesn't get into the team. Um, to like Poch, he won't be there in the summer. So, again, another yeah, I Chelsea. Think, I don't think it's that time either. No, hundred percent. Bites the dust. Yeah. Um, and the merry-go-round starts again. Who will they bring in? Thomas Tuchel is going to be available. Yeah, he is. He is indeed. <laughs> Maybe Brendan Rodgers as well. <laughs> yeah, he's come. Come pay the. Come oh, and pay that. Num- number two at Chelsea once upon a time. So Jose, Jose Mourinho. Yeah, exactly. Who knows? Who knows? But we have a lot to look forward to next week, though. That's for sure. Mayhem, absolute pleasure to have you back once again. It's been a long time coming, but we're back with a bang, as we do best. And I'm looking forward to next week already. Back to recording on Mondays. The emotion still feels fresh. It still feels within the mind. And so it just makes complete sense. Yes, we're back. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in. If you are new to the Football Booth podcast, you can check out our episodes on all audio platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Audible. You can also check us out over on YouTube where you can see our lovely faces. Have a have a waffle on for the next hour and a half. But if you're over on YouTube, if you're not follow, if you're not subscribed, do that now. Like the video, ring the bell for notifications. And until next time, ladies and gents, I bid you all good night and nostar. No